Okay, thanks for battling your way through a beautiful uh, Vermont spring day to be here this morning. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the final project before we uh, get back to the schedule. Uh, you just finished weekly report number five, and the sixth and final uh, weekly report is now, uh, is now due, and you all sort of get the idea of what we're doing now. So now you're writing up your instructions for your second milestone. Uh, after next Monday, you'll just be working on the remainder of your milestones up to and including uh, up to the uh, oral presentations during the exam period. And we'll talk about the written uh, report and the oral presentations next Tuesday, which will be our last class. Any questions about the final project? Okay, um, I wanted to just sort of throw out a few hints and tricks uh, that might be useful to you for the final project. I've already shown you a number of them. I've been receiving emails from a number of you, and you're coming up against uh, a lot of the same challenges that we face in the lab about evolutionary robotics. One of them, which is speed, right? Now that you're, you've made some changes to your robot and you're evolving to see whether the changes are beneficial, takes a while. Um, so if you haven't already, I would recommend that you try uh, implementing blind simulation runs. So to put in a flag to your code where your Python can either start up a heads-up simulation, meaning obviously you do the physics uh, and the graphics, or a blind simulation where Bullet just does the physics but doesn't op open a rendering window uh, and doesn't do any graphics for you. The blind simulation, if you implement it, you see for most of you with your laptops, things will run orders of magnitude faster. So I highly recommend this um, if you find you're waiting around for your evolutionary runs to finish. So uh, if you haven't found it already, from uh, our Ludobot subreddit up in the top right, there's the course tree there, and there's a visualization of all the projects uh, and milestones. And if you keep scrolling down underneath the tree, there's a list of all of the projects. And project number 17 here is uh, how to implement a blind evolutionary run. You need to make a little bit of change uh, to the Python code, a little bit of change to the, the C code, and things will run much, much faster. Once you implement uh, blind simulations, as you can probably imagine, you now start up your hill climber. It will run. You'll see the fitness numbers being written out as before. So you should now be able to read those two columns of numbers that are spat out by your hill climber and know that it's working. Um, and then at the end of the hill climber, it will save out the final parent, which is the robot that's obtained the highest fitness so far. Then you can start up your Python code again, but now the Python code will, instead of doing a hill climber, it will read in the uh, it'll read in the best set of synaptic weights that were written out by the previous run, and just send that set of synaptic weights to the simulation now with the graphics turned on. Right. So if you complete 17, what you're able to do now is do a, an evolutionary run for a few minutes or a few hours and it'll finish on its own, and then when you come back and when you're ready, you can restart things and now play back the best evolved controller so far. Very, very useful. Does it evolve it and then keep going and evolve it some more? You can, you can also do that. I think at the end of, the, of this particular project, it's just set up so that you have this flag and then you can use it however you want. So you can set evolution to run in blind mode, save out the best controller, and then you can modify it so later on it will read back in that evolved controller, set that as the first parent, and continue evolution in blind mode or with the graphics turned on. It's up to you, right? You can sort of mix and match once you have that flag in place. Okay. If you're still waiting around, uh, if you find you're still waiting around, um, you can try and implement Project 18. Uh, which I mentioned before, this is to parallelize your code. So now uh, your Python code can start up multiple processes that will run in parallel. And assuming you have a multi-core laptop, it will execute those simulations in parallel and you'll get uh, a further speed up. Okay. Uh, a few other things I wanted to talk about. Um, some of you are, are making changes to your fitness function. 
and you might now have multiple terms, so there might be multiple things that you're trying to optimize. And as many of you who have, many of you that have tried this now have found out that evolution often tries to cheat. How does evolution try and cheat in this case? Assume that, uh, depending on what these terms are, so one of them might be, for example, if you're trying to evolve energy-efficient locomotion, one of these terms might be maximize displacement, and the other one might be uh, minimize energy expenditure. So one of these terms might be easier for evolution to optimize than the other, right? Making energy efficient, making the robot energy efficient is much easier for evolution than making a robot displace. Why? Just don't move. Just don't move, right? So, so evolution might come up with a solution where zeros are always sent to the motors, which is a pretty easy thing to do. So one of these terms will be maximized. Let's actually say what well, it makes it easier if we think about x and y both being maximized. So let's say y represents energy efficiency. So you have infinite or maximum energy efficiency. Displacement is zero. So what? Evolution's still done pretty well. It will probably converge on a solution that has a very high value for y and zero for x. Evolution, in essence, gives up on x because x is harder. Okay. How could we modify our fitness function to force evolution not to give up on either of the two fitness terms? Let's assume we still want evolution to give us a robot that displaces and to do it in a somewhat energy efficient manner. It has to make some improvement on both. You could make the fitness be m and n of x and y. Yep, you could do that. So assuming now that we want to minimize x and y, we could use min. If you're trying to maximize x and y, we could take the maximum. Right? We could do that. Or assuming that x and y are positive, they range upward from 0, you could multiply them together. Right? So it can't give up on one of them, because if any one of these is 0 or near 0, it doesn't matter how big the other one is, you're still going to get a relatively low value. So if you're adding fitness terms to your fitness function, if you're adding terms together, I would select, I would choose either of these stricter uh, interpretations, right? It's going to force evolution to try and maximize or minimize both of them to, to some degree. Uh, okay, another thing that some of you have come up against is you're trying to evolve your robot um, to use its sensors. And often you'll find that in a lot of tasks, um, the evolution will again, because evolution is lazy, um, it will come up with the easiest solution. So if the solution is to manipulate an object and you always place the object in the same place, maybe the robot arm doesn't have to sense where the object is, it just evolves, it just evolves this motion regardless of what the sensors are doing. So again, it will always do this. So if we want to try and force evolution to use its sensors to figure out where the object is and grasp the object, how would we go about doing that? If we just have one environment put the object there, it doesn't necessarily need to use its sensors. Exactly. What, whatever you do, you're probably going to have to evaluate each controller multiple times and you're going to have to change the environment in those different conditions to force it to use its sensors, right? That's why we have senses, because the world is not always the same, right? You need to sense what's different and modify your actions appropriately. So if we just write out some pseudocode here, let's imagine this is the outer loop of your hill climber uh, in Python. We're going to iterate over a number uh, of generations, where G is in the range in the range 0 to uppercase G. So in my case, uppercase G is equal to 100 if I want to do 100 iterations of my, my hill climber. right? And then you, within this for loop, you create the child from the parent, send it to the physics engine, get back to fitness, decide whether to kill off the parent and the child, and so on, and then around and around you go. Right? 
So you can add an inner for loop here for E is in the range 0 to uppercase E. So now uppercase E, if I set this equal to 4, that means that I'm going to evaluate each genome or each, uh, each controller four times in four different environments. And now um, I might send something to the simulation that's different depending on the value of E. So when lowercase e is equal to zero, I might put the object forward and to the left of the robot. And when e is equal to one, I put the object forward and to the right of the object. Uppercase e is equal to two in this case, so two different environments. And I'm just sending the same controller twice. So in here, before we iterate over the number of environments, I might start by setting fitness equal to zero. And after, dot, 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 after I've evaluated the child, I might update fitness, fitness plus x times y. So let's say I've got, let's say my fitness function is f equals xy. I'm, I'm computing x times y for this current environment and adding it to, to fitness. So I'm accumulating fitness over multiple environments, so seeing on average how well does my robot arm do at grasping objects placed at different positions? And using the multiplication of these terms, because there are multiple criteria I want the robot arm to achieve in each one of the environments. Make sense? OK. Uh, another thing you might have come up against is, again, to try and challenge your robot to do the right thing in different environments is to choose something about the, or to randomize the environment in some way. So let's imagine, again, I use this pseudocode here. I'm going to send, I'm going to evaluate my controller in two different environments. But in each of those environments, whenever I create an environment, I'm going to place the object's position randomly, rather than saying the first environment front left and in the second environment front right. What's the problem of placing the position of the object randomly? It actually ends up making things harder for evolution. Why? It might be easier for one robot to pick an object from another. Exactly, right? So uh, if I'm a robot arm and I might get lucky and the object might get placed right in front of me twice by chance, and I just happen to have a set of synaptic weights that makes me do this. Right? So I might get very high fitness, but not for the reasons that you wanted it to. Right? So you usually want to set the environmental variations, whatever it is that you're changing in the robot's environment, deterministically, so the parent and the child are both evaluated in the same uh, circumstances. Make sense? OK. So I think this addresses a number of, of questions and comments I've got. Uh, from you all. Any other challenges you've come up against? Um, just a quick question. Sure. So if we're using a proximity sensor, yes. um, is the simplest way to add that sensor in, but to simply just add a fifth sensor to the neural network and then still have eight output neurons? Absolutely. Right. So a lot of you are adding new uh, sensors. So at the moment, you've got your four touch sensors, assuming you still have the quadruped, and you've got motor one through motor eight. If you're adding a new sensor, as you said, the easiest thing to do is just add a fifth sensor, right? So if you're adding a proximity sensor, you can put that here. If you're adding two proximity sensors, one which is on the left side of the robot and another proximity sensor that's on the right, of the robot, and it's going to try and use those two proximity sensors to triangulate towards an object. Just keep adding the sensors here. If you add a fifth and a sixth sensor, what else do you need to change in your code? The neural network in what way? The number of neurons and and the number of synapses, right? So remember that in your Python code, for the quadruped, you're evolving a set of 4 times 8, or 32 numbers. 
If you now have six sensors and eight motors, you now need six times eight or 48 uh, uh, matrix of uh, six by eight, right? You need to expand the set of synaptic weights. So you need to expand the matrix of synaptic weights on the Python side and also on the, the C side. Any other questions? No? Okay, so let's uh, let's get back to the schedule. I uh, made a number of changes uh, since last time. We've actually been making pretty good time in the lecture, so uh, in the in the course flow. So I've added in uh, an additional lecture here. So for today, I actually have two lectures that are listed here: 27 and 28. 27 is going to be a pretty short lecture. It's basically an add-on to lecture 26. And I've added in a new lecture 28, Robots That Can Adapt Like Animals. Uh, this was a publication uh, from Nature just a few, uh, few months ago. Uh, Nature is probably the most prestigious scientific journal out there. This was uh, a lot of excitement around this recent publication in evolutionary robotics, so I thought it would be worthwhile for us to have a look. We probably won't finish lecture 28 today. Um, so if we don't, we will pause lecture 28. And on Thursday, uh, Nick Cheney will be visiting, and he will be telling us about some of his work in soft robotics. Uh, Nick took this class about three years ago. He's now doing a PhD at Cornell and just spent a couple months uh, at NASA Ames helping them with uh, some robotics work there. So he'll be back telling us a little bit about his work on soft robotics. Final class next Tuesday, um, I, put, I left some time for an open discussion, and we'll probably also end up finishing lecture uh, 28. So I've tried to build some time at the end of the course here. Uh, obviously, I've done most of the talking in this course, but I'd like to open up the floor to you. If you have questions or uh, comments about some of the material we've covered, um, ideas about where you see the field going. If you want to have a discussion about the ethical side of robotics, we could do that. So come armed next Tuesday with your, your questions and comments, and we'll have a, an open discussion for the time that we, we have left. We will also, as I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, talk about what's expected for the written report and the oral presentations. All good? Okay, so we're going to jump back to lecture 26. Uh, now, where we were working our way through uh, an experiment I did a few years ago trying to answer this question of why would we bother trying to optimize both the neural controller and the mechanical structure of the robot, right? We looked in lecture 24 and 25 about how to do it, but the more important question is why would we do it? Okay. So, um, just to refresh your memory, the reason why we want to do it is we want to introduce a third, a, an intermediate time scale, right? So, so, so far, we've been evolving robots, evolving populations of robots, and any one of those robots exhibits some sensor-motor coordination and carries out some useful tasks. In the experiments I was showing you last time, we now have robots that not only evolve, but also develop. So this is this idea of evo-devo, or the evolution of development, which is a branch of biology which studies how our genes di dictate not static traits, but genes dictate how our bodies and brains change over time. Evolution dictates how we uh, develop, therefore evo-devo. And uh, in, this set of, in this set of slides, we've been looking at evo-devo-robo. Right? Why we would want to develop uh, as well as evolve robots. And as I ended last time by showing you, if you introduce this intermediate time scale, you actually accelerate evolution. You make it easier for evolution to evolve whatever the desired behavior is that you want by, in essence, putting training wheels on the robot. And the training wheels are the body of the robot itself. If you're evolving the ability for legged locomotion, it helps if you start low to the ground and gradually your center of mass increases over your lifetime because ultimately we're interested in behavior for robots that have high center of mass. Okay, so let's jump ahead to where we were last time. 
I was walking you through a whole bunch of different experiments that we did where we had different kinds uh, of changes and we were focusing ultimately on this last case where we have a robot that starts legless and gradually grows legs over its lifetime, which is ontogenic change, change over its lifetime. And then the rate at which this robot grows legs accelerates over evolutionary time until in the fourth and final phase of evolution, this infant legless form is thrown away altogether and robots are bo born, quote unquote, in the upright legged form and have to maintain that form as they locomote, right? So there's the phylogenetic change part, change, change the body over phylogenetic time. And finally, we introduced this idea of topological change last time, meaning that the topology of the robot or the number of parts that it's made up of increases over time, right? It starts without legs and gradually develops legs as it, as it goes. Okay, so we're for, focusing on this fifth experiment in the bottom row here, and the previous four experiments had less Devo, or less change over lifetime, uh, or none at all. Okay. So we went through this whole set of experiments. The top pair of images was for the quadruped, four-legged robot. The bottom pair of images was for the hexapod. The light gray bars basically is standard Evo Robo, which is the main thing, mo the most common thing we've been seeing in this class so far. Take the upright legged robot and evolve locomotion for it. The black bars correspond to that fifth experiment, which is Robo, Evo, Devo. Right? And we can see that actually when you introduce Devo, it takes many fewer robot evaluations to finally, for evolution to finally find a controller for the upright legged robot that gets it to the target object. Right? The task here was to evolve, evolve the robot to reach that target object that we would put somewhere in front of it. Okay, so the big takeaway for us is that the black bars tend to be lower than the light gray bars. And we ended last time, I think, by alternating back and forth between these two slides. This slide here, uh, sorry, this slide that we just looked at shows the speed of evolution. How quickly can it find a good solution for us. This slide shows the, robo the robustness of the solutions that were evolved. We took the evolved controllers that worked, we put them back into the robot and allowed the robot to move using that evolved controller. And when it did, we kicked it like they kicked Big Dog, right? We applied these random external forces and we saw how far the robot could get most of the time, the robot could not travel as far as it did before. So we measured the percentage drop in distance, right? So if the robot traveled 10 units, we played it back and we kicked it and it only traveled five units. That was a drop of 50% in performance. So again, the lower the bar, the better, right? The lower the drop in performance, the more robust the robot is to these external perturbations. And again, we can see that in most of the cases here that we're interested in, the black bar is lower than the light gray bar, which tells us that Evo Devo Robo is giving us more robust controllers, the black bars, than Evo Robo does. So the Devo part, the development part, allows us to evolve successful controllers faster, and they're more robust. So for us, this was the most exciting result from this experiment because it seemed to break this trade-off that everyone assumed existed. If you wanted a controller that was more robust, you need to evaluate it in more environments to make it robust to whatever changes there are in the environment. But if you do that, obviously, it's going to take many more evaluations to get there. But with Devo, we've, we've shown that you can actually break this trade-off between speed and robustness. Okay, that's where we ended last time. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so here's a summary. Here are these five experiments. 
This one seemed to work pretty well. This one worked the best. So basically, as long as the body was changing over the lifetime of the robot, and the body was changing over evolutionary time, that seemed to do the best. But there's a, a lot of things here that we did manually, and one of them is we told the computer how the developmental program should change over time. Right? We looked at accelerating the transition from the infant form to the adult form. But there's other ways we could have done this. right? So what about, and again, I'll go back and forth between these. Here's another set of experiments where, again, we're trying all these four different kinds of Evo and Devo, but now instead of accelerating the rate, of the, the rate at which the robot changes from infant to adult, we're now not increasing the rate, but changing the starting conditions. So let's look at this one here. In this case, the robot starts legless and grows into the full-legged uh, state over its lifetime. Then, in the second stage, it starts with legs that are one-third of the, of the length of the final legs and grow from that one-third length to the full length. In the third phase, the robot starts with legs that are two-thirds the final length. And then finally, as always, in the fourth and final phase, we throw away the infant form altogether. OK, given everything that I've told you so far, where would you place your money? Which of these four experiments is going to give us controllers that work for this robot with the fewest number of evaluations? <clears throat> Any money on this one? Why not? What's the problem with this one? You evolve controllers in phase one in this case, and the controllers get very good at controlling a robot that's lying flat. And then suddenly, those controllers are exposed to a robot that starts flat, but starts to become increasingly unstable as it stands up. Right? The controllers here have no experience with this body plan because they came from these ancestors. Um, so it's going to be more long, um, because at the beginning, you're, introducing, you're starting with the idea of legs growing with that motion, and then you're slowly making Exactly, right? So the Evo Devo, as before, right, is still here. The controllers that succeed for this robot have experienced all the body, possible body forms of this robot. The controllers that make it from this phase into this phase know how to, how to move the robot regardless of whether it's legged, uh, sorry, legless or legged, right? They've experienced that before. These controllers in these two cases are going to have a hard time. Right? Suddenly, these two, in these two cases here, they're exposed to conditions they've never seen before. Right? So if you've been paying attention, you should probably put your money here, and maybe your money here. Right? This one's also OK. OK, right? OK, so let's have a look. Here we go. Here is, uh, uh, here's, the, here's one of the cases here that doesn't work very well. These are the two parametric cases here. So I'm sorry, I should have labeled this better. These two experiments here correspond to these two experiments at the top here. Right? So parametric change, a parameter that dictates the angle of the legs relative to the body. And like before, red doesn't do, it does a little bit better actually than none, but it's still not very good because of this transition. And the green, as always, does better because of this Evo Devo, right? This scaffolding and this gradual removing of the training wheels. This set of experiments here corresponds to the bottom two experiments, the bottom two rows. This is the topological case where the robot is actually going from the legless to the legged form. And again, red does poorly because of this problem. And green does well because 
we are introducing this gradual change. So now we have proof that Evo Devo works, and it works under two different kinds of Evo Devo, two different ways of gradually weaning evolution off of the easier robot. Right? Okay. Uh, we did the same thing with the hexapod, and again we saw the same situation. Okay. Uh, one last set of experiments here. Um, we went back to uh, we went back to the quadruped, back to this topological change. The black bar here, the robot grows from the legless form to the legged form. We redid all the experiments in the top right panel, but now we evolved robots with wind. So as evolution was proceeding, we were kicking the robot, so it had to evolve the ability to be robust to external perturbations during evolution, and now the difference is even more pronounced. Evo Devo is even more useful the black bar, compared to just Evo. Why is the difference between the light gray bar and the black, uh, and the black bar more pronounced when we evolve under external perturbations? The light gray bar can't handle perturbations nearly as well as the black one. So the black one has way more robustness built into this way. Right. If you're legless, you're by definition lying on the ground, and if you get kicked, you're going to recover yeah. much better than if you're standing upright on, on legs and you haven't evolved the ability to deal with perturbations yet. Right. So the robot is gradually standing up over evolutionary time, and as it is, it's learning how to deal with these external perturbations as the robot becomes gradually less stable. Okay. Uh, at the end of this experiment, uh, we used some state-of-the-art robot hardware technology. I brought a friend along today to, to show you, to test out this idea. Uh, I will pass around our Evo Devo robo here. Um, please be gentle with him, um, not because he's expensive, but because I built him two years ago and I forget how I did it. So if you drop it and it breaks into a million Lego pieces, you have to put it back together. So be careful. Um, you can uh, sort of just grab it at the front and the back, and you can see that we've introduced two hinge joints, two mechanical degrees of freedom in the spine, and I'll show you some videos here in a moment. You'll notice this gear train on the front and the back. The, gear, the two gear trains here are, is to allow us to gradually change the robot's body over the robot's lifetime. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to show you a few videos. Start with this one here. You'll notice here this is before we've added on the gear train. Uh, again, let's see if I can play these in window. No? Okay, let's see here. Okay, so uh, here I've got the intelligent brick plugged in so I can actually rotate these motors. You can see that the two motors are attached 90 degrees uh, relative to one another, which allows for these two hinge joints, one which allows the front and back to rotate backward and forward, and the other one uh, allows rolling uh, about the long axis. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead a little bit here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so now I've added on the gear train, and the gear train slows down rotation, but makes the robot stronger, so it, it gradually goes from the lying flat to the standing up. So this is the parametric change case. We have not yet figured out with Lego how to extrude legs and make them increasingly vertical. If there's any Lego wizards here, if you want to spend the summer in my lab, come talk to me. Let's see if we can figure this one out. Okay. Here is the robot walking without the gear train on. So this is in the final upright. Uh, sorry, let me play this in the other order here. Aha, here we go. 
Okay, so here's the robot with the gear train. We're looking at the robot from the side. So now the motors in the spine are allowing it to twist and walk its way back and forth. Cool, so you can see it gradually goes from lying flat to more or less standing upright. Lego motors are not the strongest motors that are out there, but good enough for our case. So we can actually, in reality, approximate this morphological change. And then once we've done that at the end, we can take off, we can take off the gear train and just allow the robot to do its thing in the upright leg of chair. Yes, sir? What device do you use to control this robot? So um, if you haven't played around with Lego Mindstorms before, there's this thing called the Intelligent Brick, which I'm holding in my hand here. And you can plug that into your laptop and uh, download a simple program onto the brick. And then the brick is sending commands to the motors. And in this case, there's no sensors attached to the robot. But if there was, the sensors would come back to the Intelligent Brick and modulate the values going out to the motors. Lego Mindstorms comes with a very simple programming language that you can use to indicate what the motors should do in response to the sensors. You can also throw away their programming language, and there's a C analog and a Python analog for the Intelligent Brick. I don't know if anybody has actually simulated an artificial neural network in the Intelligent Brick, but you could probably, you could probably do it. OK. Uh, and then here's the same robot walking from the side. As I mentioned, the Lego motors are not very strong. The brick is pretty heavy, so if this robot was carrying the brick, it wouldn't be doing that. So not a fully autonomous robot. There's a human following along behind uh, with it holding its brain uh, in his hand, but you get the idea, right? Okay. So that's, uh, let's see, where are we? That's lecture uh, 20, uh, 26 here on why, uh, why evolve bodies. So we weren't actually strictly evolving bodies here. We were allowing bodies to change. But it shows that some bodies are better than others. And not only are some bodies better than others, but bodies that change over one's lifetime is a useful engineering uh, property of these, these systems. We can evolve behavior faster, and the behaviors are more robust. OK, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to quickly go through lecture 27 here, which was a follow-on experiment we did to that experiment, if I can find it. There it is. OK. OK, so just to refresh our memories, we did a whole bunch of experiments. We're going to throw all those away and just focus on these two cases here. So Evo Robo, right, just evolve controllers for the upright-legged robot, which we know does not do very well. And Evo Devo Robo, we're going to go from the legless robot to the legged robot over lifetime and over evolutionary time. OK. So remember that this is morphological scaffolding, meaning that there is scaffolding that makes things easier for evolution that's being added by the very fact that the robot's body is changing. But we can also add scaffolding to the environment. We can make the environment easier on the learner and then gradually make the environment more difficult. <coughs> what happens if we want to try and put morphological scaffolding and environmental scaffolding together. Do they help each other? Are they redundant? Do you only need one kind of scaffolding and the other one becomes redundant? Um, or do they synergize? Can we evolve robots even faster and better if we combine both kinds of scaffolding? And you could imagine, by the way, I'm asking this question, that the answer to this question is yes. The devil's in the details, though. How do you combine these two kinds of scaffolding? So I went back, we, we went back and did a bunch of different experiments now. And again, we started with no morphological scaffolding and no environmental scaffolding. This is kind of a broader question about environmental scaffolding, but how would you implement uh, like forces pushing you correcting your force in real life? 
in real life, you yeah. get on a bicycle and someone puts training wheels, or <laughs> mommy or daddy holds your hands as you're learning how to, so to we walk. We literally like put an extra device like, to help us. There's lots of ways this is done in, in nature, right? So um, if you have young brothers or sisters or young cousins, as they're starting to learn to walk, they will grab onto table edges, anything that's about that height, and will try and stand up. They will scaffold themselves using things that are out there in the environment, right? We do this all the time in different, different ways. Does okay. it include things like easier surfaces? In other words, you know, it might be easier for an animal to move on a less slippery surface. I see. Or... Yeah, could, could be. Right? I, I don't know whether animals actually seek out good surfaces on which to practice difficult tasks like learning to walk. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's, that's the case, right? We all instinctively seek out the beginnings or a simpler environment to get the handle on things, and then we try and wean ourselves off of those uh, self-imposed scaffolds as we get better at the, the task. Okay. All right, so let's have a look at one, two, how many rows do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six different experiments. And we're going to gradually add in different kinds of scaffolds as we go. And again, as usual, we're going to do multiple evolutionary runs of all six cases and see which ones do the best. So no morphological and no environmental scaffolding here. What is the environmental scaffolding? Well, we're actually using this trick here. We're going to take each controller and we're going to play back that controller four times. The first case, we're going to put an object front left of the robot, see how close it gets to the object. Play it back a second time, now putting an object front front left, a third time front front right, and a fourth time front right. So we can evaluate a controller between one and four cases. In the first case, we're going to take our controller, drop it into the upright legged robot, so no morphological scaffolding. It has to just learn how to walk on its upright, in its upright legged form. And we're going to evaluate every controller in all four environments. No scaffolding. You're going to be exposed to all four environments to start. As you can imagine, the, uh, evolution has a very hard time with this, this task. Evolution has to keep the upright legged robot from falling over. It has to figure out how to modulate turning so that it turns towards wherever the object is, and walk, and so on and so forth, right? Pretty tricky. Let's add in morphological scaffolding, but not environmental scaffolding. So this is pretty much, pretty much like the experiments we just saw. No environmental scaffolding, so we're going to evaluate every controller four times in these four different environments, but the robot in phase one is going to start legless and grow legs over its lifetime. Then it's going to start with legs that are one-third the final length and grow out to the final length over its lifetime. Start with legs two-thirds the length and grow to the full length. And then, again, as always in the end, we want an upright-legged robot that gets to all four objects. So far, so good. So morphological scaffolding, but not environmental scaffolding. As you can imagine, we're the, the third experiment is then going to be the inverse. So we're going to add environmental scaffolding, but not morphological scaffolding. So no morphological scaffolding. The robot always is in the upright legged form. But we're going to do environmental scaffolding. So in the first part of evolution, we're going to just evaluate every controller once in one environment where the object is placed front left and keep evolving until we get a controller that gets the robot uh, to the object. Once that happens, we're going to continue evolution in phase two, but now we're going to evaluate every controller twice, once with the object placed front left, and a second time with the object placed front front left, which is going to drop everyone's fitness, right, because they haven't experienced that second case before. Keep going until you evolve a controller that succeeds in both of those environments. Then add the third environment, continue evolving, and then add in the fourth one. And again, all these experiments always end with what we ultimately want, which is an upright-legged robot getting to all four objects. Okay, so no morphological, no environmental scaffolding, looking at one or the other. 
How are we going to combine these two scaffolds? Well, we could combine these two scaffolds in different ways. We could do morphological scaffolding first, and then switch to environmental scaffolding. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven phases of evolution, one long evolutionary run that we're going to push through these seven phases. We can do the inverse of that, start with our legless to legged robot, and gradually remove the environmental scaffolding. Once we finish that, we can gradually remove the morphological scaffolding and again end up with an upright legged robot <coughs> being evaluated against all four objects. What's the, seven, what's the sixth and final case? What are we missing? At the same time, or at least alternate, right? So uh, we remove a little bit of environmental scaffolding, add in one object, remove a little bit of morphological scaffolding, make a change to the body, remove some environmental scaffolding, a little bit more morphological scaffolding, a little bit more environmental scaffolding, a little bit more morphological scaffolding, and again, end up with the final case. OK, for those of you that haven't jumped ahead in the slides, Get out your money again. Where are you going to place your money and why? I'll give you a hint. This one did not win. <laughs> and we probably wouldn't have got this paper published if either of these had won either, right? So that gives you these three down here. What is it about Devo? The morphological scaffolding that helped evolution in the previous experiment. Um, it was very robust because it dealt with problems that we might have later in the process of evolving. Exactly. So, which of those situations happens here? The robots, the robot in which its body was changing, right, was experiencing a broader range of sensor motor experiences. And in that broader range of sensor motor experiences, the controller had to keep the robot upright and traveling towards the object. Which one? The one. Sorry? The bottom one. The bottom one, perhaps. OK. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't the bottom one, actually. This one. Morphological scaffolding, then environmental scaffolding. For the reason that we saw in the previous lecture, there's something about morphological change that's gradually expanding the sensor motor experience. So by the point here, it's already upright. It, controllers here know how to get the robot, or sorry, controllers here know how to get the robot to the target object while maintaining upright locomotion. So adding in a second object is not that traumatic for them, right? But these ones down here, although okay, they still haven't had, they haven't been forced to hold the upright legged form for the whole thousand time steps of the simulation, right? So things are somehow more traumatic in some of these transitions than they are up here. Isn't this kind of a form of multi objectification? Like, we have the objective of not only getting to the place, but also getting to the place as a four legged. Thing that's able to move. You could, right. So this experiment was not done in the multi objective setting, right? No, no, but it wasn't, but it, it's kind of the same uh, methodology. Yes. You know, like. So if we were to do these experiments today, we would probably do them with a, in a multi objective manner. So if you remember in multi objective optimization, we take our two fitness terms and instead of adding them or multiplying them together, we put them on these two axes. Right? So every controller corresponds to a point which represents the value of x and y obtained by that controller. And in multi-objective optimization, let's say we're trying to minimize x and y. We're trying to find controllers that are down here. We take these points. Right? These points are on the front, meaning they are, there's no other point that is better than them on both objectives. This point here is worse than this point in terms of x and in terms of 
of y. So as Slayton was mentioning here, our objectives here could be x could be get to the target object, and y could be get there in as much of the legged form as you can, right? The more legged you are and the longer you hold that form, the higher your value of, of y. So be it uh, maybe a more elegant way to do things these, these days. OK. OK, so how do we know that morphological then environmental scaffolding did better? Um, these experiments, as you can imagine, started to become pretty computationally costly. We ran these experiments on UVM supercomputer, the VACC, where you can ask for 30 hours of computation. So for every one evolutionary run, we let it go for 30 hours. And all we measured at the end of those 30 hours was, had the evolutionary run found an upright-legged robot that got to all four of the object placements Yes or no. So a binary value came back. Did evolution succeed in the 30 hours that it had or not? And we plotted the fraction of runs that succeeded. In the case of mor morphological, then environmental scaffolding, about half the runs succeeded within the 30 hour period. Um, just morphological scaffolding never did the trick. None of them finished in time. Same with these runs here. And in the other cases, a few of the runs succeeded in the 30 hours, but only a minority of them. We then took those runs that did succeed in the 30 hours and asked how long it took to do so. And in the case of morphological, then environmental scaffolding, on average, it only took six hours. So in a lot of cases, evolution went very quickly. Right? There's a large spread here. Some evolutionary runs found got through all seven phases in just a few hours, and in other cases, evolution never made it through these phases in 30 hours. Huge, huge spread. OK. So uh, let's see. I will try and play these videos for you. Um, there's a lot of videos here, so we'll see how well we do. I'm going to walk you through one evolutionary run of morphological, then environmental scaffolding. So in these four videos, you're going to see morphological scaffolding. Then we're going to see environmental scaffolding. Let's see how well I can do this. It would be great if these played in, but they don't. I'm optimistic. One of these days, this is actually going to work. Let's, let's try this. No such luck. OK. Okay, here we go. Okay, here's so remember we have uh, seven phases to get through. Here's phase uh, one, which you've seen before, or phase zero. Go from the legless, legged, legless to the legged form. Then go from the legless to the legged form a little bit faster, and then hold the legged form for the last part of the robot's lifetime. Phase uh, the third phase, go from the infant to the adult legged form even faster and hold it. Actually goes flying past the object, but good enough. Fourth phase, throw away the infant form altogether. You can see the twisting in the spine, not unlike the, the Lego robot that's here somewhere. So now we've removed all of the morphological scaffolding, and now we're going to gradually start to remove the environmental scaffolding. Up to this point, the robot has just been evaluated against the object front left. So now it's evaluated against front left and front front left. So at this phase, every controller is evaluated twice, once front left, front front left. In the sixth phase, every controller is evaluated three times, front left, front front left, front front right. And in the seventh and final phase, every controller is evaluated four times. And this particular evolved controller works in all four of those cases. Why was morphological then environmental scaffolding useful in this particular run? 
So I showed you a bunch of evolved controllers. You can see they're all kind of related to one another. What was the general strategy that these controllers hit upon? Where was most of the locomotion coming from? It's the twisting in the spine, right? If you look at the legs, they're not doing too much of anything, which makes sense. The ancestor of this controller, way back at the beginning of evolution, had to control a robot that at least for the first few time steps of the simulation was legless. So if you wanted to get to the target object, all you could do was twist your, your trunk. Right? So it retained that strategy and added a little bit. So the legs are helping a little bit, but it, it's adapting that as we're removing all of this, this scaffolding, which is, again, not unlike how biological evolution works. Evolution tends to be lazy. Once a strategy works, you adapt that existing strategy and add on to it as the situation changes, you do not throw away something that already works and try and re-evolve something new from, from scratch. Okay. Okay, again, very short lecture on lecture 27 there. Um, really trying to drive home this point as to why you would want to evolve morphology. So again, um, we're gonna, we've got a little bit of uh, extra time now, so I'm going to start in on lecture 28. We probably won't finish it today. We'll finish lecture 28 uh, next Tuesday. So uh, robots that can adapt like animals, lecture 28. Let's see if I can find it. OK, here we go. As I mentioned, this is a very recent publication uh, a couple months back. Um, it was published in, in Nature, and again, this idea of adaptation. So this lecture actually belongs not in this section, but belongs in the section on the reality gap. So actually, let's jump back to the schedule for a moment. Remember our lectures about the reality gap, 16 through 19, we looked at adding noise to the simulator, so evolution can't cheat and lock on to certain aspects of the simulation. We looked at the Golem project from the year 2000, uh, when 3D printers were just starting to appear, the idea here was to automate design by evolving robots and simulation, evolving bodies and brains, and then automating manufacture by printing out physical versions of those evolved virtual creatures. Then we looked at a project that I was involved in back in 2006, the Resilient Machines Project. So this was the evil starfish, the black quadruped where we pulled off one of its legs, and that robot was evolving its own simulator, right? It was taking experiences from the physical world and incorporating them through evolution into the simulator. They were tuning up the simulator. And the reason we did that in the Resilient Machines Project is that allowed us to deploy a robot that if it became damaged, it could diagnose what went wrong and evolve a way to compensate for that damage. The problem with the Resilient Machines project is it takes a while, right? So this was a project we did for NASA. NASA said, take all the time in the world. Assume we have a, a rover that may be in a dangerous situation. We wanted to think about what the problem is and come up with a strategy um, uh, that works, assuming that you have all the time in the world. The Resilient Machines project does not work so well or would not work so well for a robot probe that lands on the side of a crater and, and its accelerometer is indicating that the robot's accel uh, acceleration is increasing. Right? So what happens if you need to adapt and you don't have a lot of time to do so? That's what this new paper uh, published a few months ago tackles. So as we work our way through Lecture 28, you're going to see a lot of similarities to the Resilient Machines project. The main difference that these authors tried to tackle is get a robot to adapt as quickly as possible. OK, I'm going to start by just playing uh, a video summary of this experiment, and then we'll go into a little bit of the details. Robots that can adapt like natural animals. A paper in Nature that describes damage recovery in robots via the Intelligent Trial and Error algorithm. How can we get robots like these to adapt to damage like natural animals? 
Before deployment, a robot uses a novel algorithm to autonomously create a map of different ways to behave and the value of each behavior. Here is a variety of entirely different ways to walk produced by this algorithm. Note that the behaviors are only tested in simulation at this point. The discovered behaviors create a map of the behavior performance space. The map shown was created with the Map Elite algorithm and contains the robot's intuitions about different ways to move and the predicted performance of each way of moving. Now see the undamaged robot controlled by a classic tripod gate. Note that the robot moves straight and at a speed of 0.25 meters per second. The robot has now become damaged. Let's see if it can still walk. Unfortunately, this robot, like most robots, no longer works if damaged. Because the pre-damaged behavior no longer works, the robot needs to adapt. The robot conducts a handful of experiments to determine a behavior that still works despite the damage. To do so, it combines Bayesian optimization with its intuitions about the behavior performance space provided by the map from the Map Elite's algorithm. Here is the first gate from the map it tries. Each experiment updates the robot's understanding of which behaviors work and which do not. After the map is updated with this new information, a new type of behavior is tested by choosing a high-performing behavior from a different region of the map. The map is then updated based on that experiment, and the process repeats. Note that the map is getting more blue over time meaning that the robot is learning that most of the performance predictions from simulation on the undamaged robot do not perform that well on the real damaged robot. In less than 40 seconds, the algorithm has discovered a gate that's nearly as effective as the original. Because the map predicts a better gate may still exist, the robot conducts one more test, but that prediction turns out to be wrong. The intelligent trial and error algorithm thus terminates, selecting the best gate found which is nearly as fast and straight as the original. Watching the gate in slow motion reveals that it is dynamic and really seems natural. It almost looks like a wounded animal limping away. The gate is mostly straight and is 96% as fast as the original gate before damage. The same algorithm can work with many other robots. We tested it with a robotic arm. Like many robots in factories, the arm's job is to place an object into the appropriate bin. In this case, damage occurs when one of the motors becomes unresponsive. Once again, the damage prevents the robot from performing its job. The robot needs to adapt. So the same intelligent trial and error algorithm is launched. Here you can see multiple different behaviors being tested, the performance of those behaviors, measured as the distance to the target, and the map of predicted performance values being updated. In the upper right hand corner you can see how long the process takes, which is only a matter of seconds. In less than 20 seconds, without one of its motors working at all, the robot is able to adapt and complete its task. Our experiments verify that intelligent trial and error enables the legged robot to adapt to at least six different types of damage, including completely removing two legs, and 14 different types of damage to the robotic arm, including two motors being broken. When a piece of one of the legs of the hexapod breaks off, the classic tripod gate no longer works. Here is the result of intelligent trial and error after only 25 seconds. In this case, the damaged robot is even faster than the original. Now let's see what happens with the robotic arm if two of its motors don't work. The original behavior no longer performs the task, as expected. But after 28 seconds, the arm adapts and is able to drop the ball in the basket. For more information and additional video. Okay, so again, another robot now that recovers from unanticipated damage. So there's no pre-programmed 
uh, there's no pre-programmed code that says if your front leg breaks off, then do this, right? Because if we did that, there'd be an, almost an infinite number of if-then statements we'd have to write to deal with every possible thing that can go wrong, which we can't know ahead of time. So we want a robot that adapts. We want it to do it as quickly as possible. Is having presumptively large possibility space, right? So is evolving just many, many different ways to do the same thing with a full, healthy robot really more effective than just making an algorithm to model all the different ways it might go wrong? So that's a great question, right? So now there are these two approaches, the resilient machines approach and adapting like animals approach. Yeah. Our approach has the disadvantage that it takes a while. This approach has the disadvantage at the moment of assuming that if you have a large number of behaviors already available, that at least one of those is going to be useful after damage, right? And how many do you have to have for right. that to be true? That remains to be, to be seen. Okay, so let's have a look in a little more detail about how this actually works. Uh, you've probably all already seen lots of examples of humans and animals that recover from extreme cases of disability. Here's our robot. Uh, in this case, the robot's equipped uh, with an RGBD camera, so red component, green component, blue component, and distance. So the physical robot has distance information. The simulated robot, which isn't on this slide, has touch information. We'll come back to why that's important in a moment. We looked at these different kinds of damage that might occur. In this case, they just sheared off the bottom part of one of the six legs. After the damage, what basically, they, they, in the video, they mentioned this intelligent trial and error process. So the robot is trying out different things one thing, two thing. In the third case, it happens to hit on something that works. It hits on a compensating behavior that compensates for, for the damage. These behaviors that are being tried out are behaviors that have already been optimized on the simulated robot. So this robot has millions of behaviors that have already been evolved that worked for the simulated intact hexapod robot. And among those millions, they're trying to intelligently, quickly figure out through trial and error which one works for the damage. As you can imagine now, again, the devil is in the details. How do you sift through millions of simulated behaviors, millions of previously evolved behaviors, and within 25 seconds or 40 seconds or you know, four or five or six trials, hit on one that works? That's the real advance of this, this work. OK, so let's see how that works. Again, they have their simulated, undamaged hexapod robot. And they have a very high dimensional search space. Right? So what this is meant to represent here, this is actually a four dimensional cube. But the dimension is actually a lot higher than that. Right? In assignment 10, when you're evolving controllers for your quadruped, you had four times eight, 32 synaptic weights. Each one of those 32 numbers represents one dimension in the 32 dimensional space that your hill climber is searching. Right? It's to all intents and purposes an infinite space. Right? Okay, so this picture is meant to represent that, right? the space of all possible controllers for the hexapod. In this experiment, they start by reducing this high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. This is one of the big parts of the advance of this. How do they do that? Well, instead of de defining the size of the space based on the genotype, right, which remember, in our case, would be the 32 numbers that we're evolving for uh, the behavior of the robot. Instead, they define a search space based on the phenotype, which in this case is how the robot moves. How does this work? Well, in this cartoon here, there are only two dimensions, or two numbers, and those numbers can range between 0 and 1. They take a controller from this space, so they create, start by creating a random controller, download it onto the simulated hexapod robot, 
The hexapod robot does its thing using that controller in the simulation. And they record two numbers about the phenotype, which is what is the fraction of time that the left front foot touches the ground, and what is the fraction of time that the front right foot touches the ground. So that's a fraction, so it ranges between 0 and 1. So if we find the pixel that corresponds to position 0, 0 in this two-dimensional plane, that point corresponds to a controller that causes the hexapod to not touch the ground at all with its front two feet. Right? So far, so good? This point out here, this pixel that corresponds to position 1, 1, that pixel also corresponds to the phenotype or the behavior produced by a controller. And what did that controller cause the hexapod to do in that case? Not stand still. <clears throat> two front legs stay on the, ground the, the, two, the two front legs stay on the ground the whole time, right? These two numbers <clears throat> represent what happens to the robot when you play that controller on the robot, right? So this point out here corresponds to some controller. The robot may have stood still, or it might have moved and dragged its front two feet along the ground as it went. This, this picture says nothing about how far the robot got or how it moved. Well, it says something about how it moved, just about how the two feet, how much time the two front feet were in contact with the ground. The central pixel here corresponds to another controller in which the two front feet were touching the ground about 50% of the, the time. Okay. Given that, you can see that obviously all of the pixels in this two-dimensional plane have a color associated with them. What do you think the color represents? The position of the pixel tells you something about how the robot moved, how much time were the front two feet in contact with the ground. What do you think the color of the pixel tells you? Distance, exactly, right? So every, every pixel here corresponds to a controller that made the robot do what it did, and the color represents how far the simulated robot traveled using that controller, which gives us this colorized plane. So red is always going to be higher in this. So this is a heat map. So the more red, the more hot, the better it is. So a controller that causes the robot to drag its front feet has a blue-green color, which means it probably didn't do very well. Maybe it did actually stand still. This pixel up here, whatever that one is, that caused the simulated robot to move as far as possible. Okay, so here we have the space of all possible controllers defined by the number of numbers in the genotype. Here we also have a bunch of controllers that are defined by the phenotype, how those controllers made the robot move. Okay, final piece here is obviously, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this if there wasn't evolution here somewhere, right? So. How did they evolve controllers for this robot? Well, they started by creating a population of controllers, let's say 100. They evaluated each of those random controllers on the robot. And then they dropped those controllers into the relevant pixels in this lower dimensional space. Right? They found the position of the pixel based on how the robot moved. And they colored the pixel based on how far the robot moved. So now we have a sprinkling of 100 pixels in an otherwise empty plane. Now they took one of those 100 controllers, made a randomly modified copy of it through mutation and or crossover, evaluated it again, and now took that pixel and dropped it somewhere in the plane. And they eventually gradually started to fill the plane, and after a while, when they picked a point at random, created a randomly modified copy of it, they tried to put that resulting pixel or that resulting controller in a box, in a pixel that already contained a controller. What do you think they did when there was a collision? There's some existing controller that's already sitting in that pixel. They just evaluated a new controller on the robot and they want to put it in that box. How did they decide what to do? It's like when we were developing, well, not me, but when we were looking at how to develop Rumble, you just replace the ones that were formed for the thing. 
That's it, right? So you have two controllers, one that's already in the box and one you're trying to put in the box. Which one got the simulated hexapod to travel the further? That's the one that goes in the box, the other one's thrown away. Repeat, right? That's the evolutionary algorithm that they, they used. Okay, next week we'll come back to this and we'll look at the conclusion about how they use this to allow a robot to adapt rapidly to damage. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on weekly report number six. And on Thursday, we will have an alumnus of the course, Nick Cheney, uh, talking about evolving soft robots. Thanks very much.